Hello, my name is Christine Barkley. We will be talking about Shakespeare's plays, his uh, main speeches, his ideas, his themes, his characters uh, in later lectures, but for this first lecture, I want to kind of put um, Shakespeare in context in the, in, into the Renaissance culture so that you understand where some of his ideas were coming from, how they were being tossed about in his own time period. So we're going to do an introduction to um, the Renaissance, Shakespeare's theater, his main character types. And I want to begin with probably the most complex of the uh, tenets that we're going to talk about today, and that is the Renaissance Christian humanist worldview and the Machiavellian worldview so that you understand the clashing cultures that existed at the time that Shakespeare was referencing and debating in his plays. Um, going to the dominant uh, worldviews of the time, um, I'd like to trace where the Renaissance Christian humanist worldview came from. It actually came from the Middle Ages and the um, Ptolemaic worldview that existed at the time, which suggested that the Earth was at the center of the universe. Of course, Copernicus later on um, challenged that and changed our view, uh, showed us that the, wor the world was round and it was actually the third planet from the sun and that the Earth rotated around the sun, not the sun uh, rotating around the Earth. And so the concept that the great chain of being is based on was disproved in the Renaissance, but at this particular time, um, it was still accepted. So we have a hierarchical system that um, was accepted in the Middle Ages that was uh, taught. Again, we don't have books um, until the Renaissance, so all of the learning takes place through uh, through talks, through speeches, most often at church. Uh, so the priests have a, a great deal of influence on the belief structures of the day. And um, their uh, explanation of the great chain of being was that it was a hierarchical system with God and the angels above man, man being in control of the earth, uh, in control of the animals, the plants, the minerals, all of those things are at the bottom of this hierarchy. Within each species, there's also a hierarchy. This is all part of the Renaissance Christian humanist worldview, that there are answers to everything, that uh, man has a particular place in his world. He is either born as, um, as a noble or he's born as a serf, and that this is all part of God's plan and he's supposed to be there, and it's part of the hierarchical system that is established or that is accepted in the Renaissance. Um, as part of the, uh, the different um, hierarchies, we have a sense that uh, God has an overarching plan uh, for the world and that that's why certain people are born as heirs to kingdoms or as um, serfs or in Shakespeare's time as merchants, etc. We have a new class that's being developed at that particular um, point. But part of the system of order, um, the concept of the system of order, is that it can be disrupted if the hierarchy is not adhered to. And therefore, if you usurp the throne of a king, then since that was part of the overarching plan, uh, God's overarching plan, then somehow or another there are going to be rep repercussions uh, to this. It also suggests that everyone has a purpose in life um, and that, that they were born into that's part of this overarching plan. And what we need to do as individual humans is to simply de um, find and fulfill that particular purpose. Let me show you a graphic of the uh, great chain of being, the uh, system of analogy that is used as part of um, Shakespeare's language, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But I want to show you what some of these uh, correspondences were. Um, the kings were uh, on the top, again, chosen by God. The nobles, the upper class, professionals, trade workers, peasants, these are the serfs that are on the bottom. And again, this is a hierarchy that is um, of class structure that is pretty rigidly adhered to. Uh, it corresponds to the sun being the top of the uh, planetary um, bodies, the sun, and then the moon, then the planets, then the stars. Again, in terms of the elements, fire, air, water, earth, everything that um, 
that is part of our, our world is set up in these different hierarchies. So what we're going to find in terms of language is the king will be compared to the sun, or the king may be compared to the lion over here, or uh, reason, which is the higher of the um, uh, uh, faculties of man. And uh, Shakespeare can use this kind of shorthand metaphorical language to suggest this concept of the system of order that we just talked about, which is the overarching plan concept. There are uh, several humanist views that um, came about uh, or, or were um, discussed and debated in the Renaissance that end up getting added to the uh, main Christian concept of the great chain of being as part of the Renaissance Christian humanist worldview that I keep referring to, or that I will keep referring to uh, throughout the course of these lectures. So to the Christian belief structure, the Renaissance added the humanist belief of self-determinism. And that was the idea that not, not just that you're uh, born into a particular role and you don't really have to do anything, you just exist in that role. The humanist belief is that you have to constantly be uh, bettering yourself, uh, trying to improve your world, that it isn't just a plan of God's that is being fulfilled, but that we all have a role in that plan and that um, we need to uh, fulfill that particular purpose in order to be living a full life. Um, there's still a kind of ideal beyond the world but what we need to do is um, be worthy of it. So we can never quite reach that ideal. Um, it's, it's beyond our grasp. That's the heaven concept. But we need to be striving for that. This is actually going back to uh, some of the idea of the sophists, the Greek sophists, uh, which, who suggested that um, we needed to be constantly improving ourselves. And Shakespeare's uh, picking up on this, the whole Renaissance humanist movement was picking up on these ideas and incorporating it into the Renaissance Christian humanist worldview. So we have two um, uh, oppositions, predestination and free, free will. And they're actually combined in the concept of the Renaissance Christian humanist worldview belief system because uh, the overarching universe is the predestination, but the free will part of that is that each man is responsible for his own actions and responsible to make himself into that ideal self. Um, I want to show you another uh, graphic just using the example of love, uh, because I think that's maybe the, the easiest one that we can um, understand this concept of the ideal from. Uh, capital love or ideal love is the kind of love that, that God can um, show. Uh, it is possible only in a timeless world of no change, and so therefore in, in eternity, that sort of idea. Our love, our, our, in our world, we can experience love, usually indicated as lowercase love, um, that is a, a reflection of this ideal love, but um, we can never quite achieve the same kind of love that we would find in a timeless world or that God could e exhibit for us. The same thing is true with identity, and this is very important in Shakespeare's characters. In other words, you can have this capital identity, this is the Renaissance Christian humanist idea, that we are, uh, that's the perfect self that we are supposed to be working toward throughout our lives as we, um, as we work to better ourselves, as we try to uh, become um, uh, better people. Uh, we can, uh, the fact that, that in our own world, our real world self is weak and sinful and um, uh, not perfect in any way is what we are working with uh, in order to strive for this particular ideal. Going to the, uh, the again, the dominant uh, Renaissance worldviews, I want to compare the, the Christian humanist worldview, which is the one we just talked about, to the Machiavellian worldview, which was also gaining a lot of um, interest and um, notoriety in the Renaissance. It, it actually was a rather radical idea that Machiavell, uh, Machiavelli presented in his book, The Prince, uh, suggesting that, um, for example, uh, history was, uh, was not necessarily a way of uh, providing moral example, which would be true if there was an overarching universe, but it's really just chance, uh, which would be true if there is no God. So you can see why these particular worldviews are, are kind of in complete opposition to each other. 
Um, one of the things I'm going to be doing throughout the uh, course of these lectures is giving you lots of examples from the plays of uh, Renaissance Christian humanists, speeches that, that illustrate those beliefs or Machiavellian actions or uh, characters or speeches that illustrate uh, those worldviews. So as I'm going through this introduction, I'm going to do this in a very kind of perfunctory manner, not perfunctory, but um, uh, quicker uh, presentation of it. And um, I realize that these are very important tenets, but they are also very complex ideas. And so if you don't completely understand them just from this lecture material, I hope that you will try to, to uh, find references to them in the various plays, because I think that'll be the best way for you to understand these ideas. This is part of what Shakespeare is doing, is exploring these particular worldviews. So in the Renaissance Christian humanist um, worldview, we have the concept that history is a moral lesson. And we'll see this in the history plays especially. The idea there is that um, um, the, the king, the present king or queen, Queen Elizabeth in Shakespeare's time, um, could learn how to be an ideal monarch, what is the role of the king or the role of the queen, um, from studying history because if all of that was part of an overarching plan, God's plan, then he would be illustrating what makes for a good monarch, what makes for a poor ruler through history. So we look to history for moral lessons of some sort. Contrast that with the Machiavellian worldview, which suggests that history is really part of a natural cycle. And he suggested that, um, that there actually was a cycle. I'm going to see if I can do this, something that I would do up on the board um, very, very quickly. Machiavellian's view was that you might have a monarch here, but the inevitability was that the monarch was going to turn tyrant. And when the, the monarch turned tyrant, then the, um, the aristocrats would overthrow. Um, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. Uh, when the monarch turned tyrant, then the people would overthrow the, um, the tyrant. And then you might end up with anarchy. And that from that, you would end up with a group of people that would come forward. They would become the aristocracy. Um, and then they would. Uh, rule and at some point or another because they were having a hard time um, agreeing on the rule then they would choose to elect a monarch who would be the supreme um, the supreme ruler so you had a kind of cyclical view of nature that that didn't necessarily um, suggest that people learned uh, from past history but did suggest that um, it was uh, it was just um, uh, chance occurrences. Okay, uh, going through this a little bit more quickly, there in the Renaissance Christian Humanists, you have the overarching plan, whereas in the Machiavellian, everything is just chance or fortune. It's just a, a fortuitous um, change of situation, not necessarily part of an overarching plan. The great chain of being represents the Renaissance Christian Humanist belief structure, however, and that includes the idea of the ideal self. The Machiavellian suggests that man makes his own place uh, in the world, and um, it's through his own power, his own intelligence, his own, uh, his own scheming sometimes even that he makes that particular place, not based on how he's born. Um, nature is understood through the Bible for the Renaissance Christian humanists, as opposed through uh, logic and reason and science. Science is becoming very important in the Renaissance, and the Machiavellians are turning to science for answers rather than turning to religion, rather than turning to the Bible. The language of um, the Renaissance Christian humanists is the metaphorical language, and that is that connection between the king, the son, the uh, the lion, all of the things that are on the top of the hierarchies uh, can be used metaphorically as kind of shorthand to uh, suggest that belief in that system of order. Uh, the language that is used by the Machiavellians is much more scientific. It'll be uh, connected to uh, money or it'll be connected to reason or it'll be connected to science. So differences in language. Also, the Renaissance Christian humanists tend to speak more in poetry, um, and the, the Machiavellians tend to speak more in prose. Um, going to language itself uh, and focusing in on that um, in a little bit more depth, 
I just said this, so uh, here's a slide that ends up showing it, that the Renaissance Christian humanists tend to speak in poetry, that they use metaphorical or figurative language, whereas the Machiavellians uh, speak more in prose and use scientific logical reasoning uh, to show um, what's important. Going back to that comparison between the Renaissance Christian humanist worldview and the Machiavellian worldview, there, the Renaissance Christian humanists saw the state as a microcosm of the divine world. So if something happens that disrupts the order of the state, for example, there is a, um, in Julius Caesar, there is a conspiracy being planned to kill off Julius Caesar. The Renaissance Christian humanists would say that the natural world might very well um, uh, illustrate God's reaction to that conspiracy by um, sending a storm uh, to suggest that that something's wrong. Uh, the same thing is uh, could be seen in uh, Lear's Heath scene where he sent out into the storm. It's as if the natural world is somehow or another commenting on what's happening at the state level uh, because of uh, God's view of what's happening at the state level. The Machiavellians, on the other hand, um, do not see God's uh, intervention in state affairs. They basically see man controlling his own um, environment, controlling his own uh, destiny through power rather than through uh, right or privilege, the whole idea of the divine right of kings. Um, so they, d they don't see that as um, influencing state issues they see uh, who has the biggest army, or who is the um, the cleverest person, uh, or who is willing to do whatever is necessary, even if it means assassination, in order to uh, get the power and therefore have the rule. Uh, the Renaissance Christian humanists, again, believe in the divine right of kings. They believe that time and change is moving toward perfection. That's that idea of the ideal self or the ideal of love, of the whole idea of the state moving toward a state of perfection. If each monarch can learn from the history of the past and um, improve upon uh, the mistakes that had been made by uh, previous monarchs, then we can be w moving toward a state that would be more ideal, more in conjunction with this uh, system of order or with God's plan, that overarching universe. The Machiavellians, on the other hand, do not see uh, time or change as moving toward something better. They see it simply as, again, cyclical. Um, they, they see the world uh, really more as um, uh, a vertical, um, I, I mean, a, a horizontal uh, view of time as opposed to the vertical view that the Renaissance Christian humanists see, which is uh, ascending upward. Identity is very important. It has to do with what a person is like. And the Renaissance Christian humanists who believe that appearance and reality are exactly the same thing would see um, uh, identity in more simplistic terms than the, the Machiavellians would. In other words, they'd see it as uh, whatever you perceive the person to be, if that person is perceived to be honorable, they are honorable. And in fact, they are striving to become more honorable, become more that ideal self that is that they are capable of um, through the choices that they make in the world, the actions that they take. The uh, Machiavellians, on the other hand, had an, the idea that identity is uh, pluralistic. In other words, that a person can act in an honorable fashion toward one uh, person and dishonorably toward someone else. Or, uh, honorably at one time and dishonorably at another time. Or another way of putting that, I guess, would be that, that they could pretend to be honorable with one person, for example, Iago with Othello, and yet in reality have um, a more villainous in, in, uh, interest, uh, their own self-interest in, in mind, and uh, therefore have different kind of personalities or different uh, characters that are exhibited at different times. In other words, that we can play uh, many roles uh, throughout our lifetimes or that we can uh, play act at many different kinds of people based on who we're interacting with. Um, our characters, Shakespeare's characters, I should say, uh, can be subdivided into the primary characters and the secondary characters. The primary characters are dynamic in that they change. 
Uh, they grow. Um, many of them begin as Renaissance Christian humanists. They have a certain kind of blindness at the beginning of the play, like Lear or like Othello, and they have to learn the consequences of that blindness, the consequences of that trust or mistrust, and um, therefore change, grow, learn, again, part of history being the moral lesson um, and the purpose of the play being um, the growth or the learning, the knowledge of the main character. That's part of our dynamic change. We do have some characters who don't change that much, but their character is revealed through the course of the, of the play. Uh, in other words, characters that are fairly ideal to begin with, like Hal from Henry IV Part I, um, we're not going to see him necessarily have to grow because the perception of King Henry V, who is Hal, uh, is that he was already an ideal character. So basically, his character is revealed to us through the course of the play. Um, our protagonists, our antagonists, both of them are probably going to be primary characters um, and uh, more complex characters than our secondary characters. Our secondary characters are often static. They don't change. Uh, themselves. We don't see growth on their part or, or um, revelations, epiphanies that they go through as we do with our primary characters. Uh, they are simpler, more stereotyped, but they're very important to the, to the play because as reflexive characters, their interactions, either the dialogue that they have with the main characters, uh, antagonists or protagonists, or the uh, interactions, the actions that, that they perform with uh, or two, the, the main characters, uh, also tell us something about those main characters. So the secondary characters are very important in revealing to us the, um, sometimes the complexity of the main characters and sometimes the change or growth of the main characters. Um, we run into two main types in uh, Shakespeare's tragedies especially, but throughout his, his plays. And this term, the fair and the foul, actually comes from Macbeth. Duncan is called the fair, uh, and uh, he seems to be the epitome of this Renaissance Christian humanist type character, or at least a character that, that um, uh, accepts the belief structures of the Renaissance Christian humanist. The foul tends to be um, a character that accepts the tenets of the Machiavellian worldview and is associated in Macbeth with Macbeth himself, the title character. But differentiating these two, the characters that um, are the Renaissance Christian humanists, this would be Othello, Hamlet, um, Duncan in Macbeth, and also Lear in Lear from the main um, tragedies, uh, view the past as some kind of heroic myth. Again, something that you can learn from, but also uh, some, something that was glorious, a golden age of the past. Uh, the idea that um, uh, the past illustrates what true heroism is would be a Renaissance Christian humanist belief. It would be something that the fair characters would exhibit, as opposed to the Machiavellian characters who would see, um, who wouldn't care that much about the past. They would be more interested in the present or possibly the future, but really they would be more living in the present but their perception of the present would be that it would be corrupt. Uh, in other words, that there really isn't heroism possible. Um, this, by the way, is a, a much more modern view, and one of the reasons that I think many modern 20th century critics or 21st century critics um, still value Shakespeare's ideas because he seems to have been ahead of his time in recognizing um, some of the truths that we accept today. Um, for the fair character, he lives in an ideal world as opposed to the Machiavellian character who um, lives in a corrupt world or what it will be referred to as the unweeded garden in uh, Richard II. Um, the fair uh, character uh, thinks that his actions should be heroic actions. He thinks he, he lives in a world of heroic actions, whereas the Machiavellian um, uh, character lives more in a world of intrigue, of spying and eavesdropping and um, plotting and gaining power uh, and then utilizing that power. The fair is often involved in advice giving and um, uh, maintaining traditions as opposed to the Machiavellian character who would be involved in um, spying, eavesdropping, and um, manipulating in some way the world that he lives in. 
Um, also, the fair uh, is connected to the concept of innocence and idealism. Um, and again, that's part of the blinders. That's part of the naivete of this particular character. The Machiavellian character is more uh, connected with experience. But with that experience comes a sense of cynicism. Um, the fair is the character that would be more likely to trust um, others. Again, the appearance versus reality, belief of the Renaissance Christian humanist uh, tends to um, make them think that if someone looks like they are a, um, a faithful follower, that they actually uh, can be trusted and then that they should be trusted. And sometimes this proves to the disadvantage of the Renaissance Christian humanist character because they're seen as too trusting in that situation. Whereas the Machiavellian character is more likely to be suspicious, is more likely to doubt, is more likely to see through the motivations of others, um, may very well be more um, malcontent or unhappy within the world. Again, part of that is that the, uh, that the world, the, the Machiavellian character sees the world as corrupt and um, deceitful and therefore is functioning in that way as well. The uh, fair character wants to remember the past and we remember Hamlet especially wanting to uh, remember the glories of the days of his father, old Hamlet, and being upset when those seem to be being forgotten by Denmark. Whereas the, um, the Machiavellian characters are more concerned about experiencing or actually perhaps we might even say more concerned about controlling the present. Going on to the stage, I want to show you a picture of the stage, uh, Shakespeare's stage. Now this is a recreation that we have um, that has been just built recently within the last 10 years uh, in London, um, but built uh, to resemble Shakespeare's stage. And um, I want to talk about the particular uh, aspects of staging that, that Shakespeare would have been uh, would have had to use in his particular um, time period. Of course, there really, isn't, there really isn't a set design. We don't have like backdrops that we would see in, in uh, modern versions of Shakespeare's plays. So um, it, it's hard to establish a place uh, or differentiate between one place and another place by having different backdrops or different scenery. And therefore, the, um, the language that Shakespeare provides for his actors has to establish where they are and what the time period is, whether it's night, whether it's day, uh, whether it's hot. Um, so you'll often see at the beginning of um, various scenes language that establishes where they are and um, sets the mood for that particular time. I'll direct you particularly to Midsummer Night's Dream where um, you have some of the most beautiful language um, making us feel like it's uh, early morning with um, the dew still on the grass, et cetera, and the coolness in the air. And, and Shakespeare can do this just through language. So in a sense, that's what takes the place of backdrops or props. Um, there can be props. You can bring on, for example, onto the stage, there can be a platform down here, a raised platform that the, um, that the king uh, could stand on. You can even bring out a throne. But remember that uh, whatever is brought out onto the stage must then also be taken off of the stage for the next scene. So they have to be movable enough that the actors themselves can um, kind of uh, surreptitiously bring them out and make them part of that particular uh, scene. Going back to the stage, you have two entrances, uh, two doorways that lead into the stage. And what Shakespeare would do, he often had his acts uh, going back and forth between two different places. So he would have one set of actors coming on the stage from one doorway. They would exit out that doorway. Another set of actors would exit, would enter from the other doorway. And um, because you didn't really have a curtain that could be drawn uh, to differentiate the scenes, this way it was, it was, Shakespeare was able to move the play along quickly um, um, by uh, bringing, bringing on some actors as others were exiting. We have the balcony up here for the Romeo and Juliet and also for the Flint Castle scene in, in um, Richard II. You have a trap door that will be used in um, Hamlet for the gravedigger scene. 
So these are all of the entrances, exits, and, and areas on the stage that Shakespeare can use um, in developing his plays. We should remember uh, that if a character dies on the stage, um, th since there is no curtain, you can't really draw the curtain, allow the person to um, uh, stand up and walk off the, the set. So uh, Shakespeare has to find a way to get that body off the stage. Uh, and therefore, he usually develops language that says, uh, uh, bear this body you know, to the next room or something like that. Um, and that gets that um, dead body off the stage without breaking the illusion that the character is actually dead. Um, and uh, so that's one of the things that Shakespeare has to work around in terms of um, killing people off on stage, which is one of the reasons that we hear about deaths taking place off stage a lot of times. But we do actually see uh, people being killed on stage. Um, it also makes it very interesting because we'll take a look at King Lear. And at the end of King Lear, Shakespeare actually has bodies brought back onto the stage. There's language that says that uh, Lear is directing um, the bodies of Cordelia and Reagan to be brought onto the stage. This is very, very unusual because, of course, Shakespeare has to go to great lengths to get them off. So we have to ask ourselves, why would he be creating language that suggests bringing bodies back on stage? The fact that the stage is a fixed place means that, for example, this middle area here uh, could be considered the area for the king. Um, and uh, it becomes kind of a visual image for the audience. And so we can have a, a particular part of the stage that that's, uh, represents justice, or a particular part of the stage that represents power. And um, Shakespeare can use these going back and forth between different scenes. Uh, we'll see this in Henry IV, Part One, when we have um, uh, uh, we have Henry IV on the on the throne, and then in the jest scene, we also have uh, both Falstaff and um, and Hal, Henry V, taking that particular position on the stage as they play act uh, being the king themselves. So Shakespeare can use his stage and the memory of what's uh, and, and the visual image that it creates for us in our memory to make particular points um, through his plays. The uh, reading of the plays itself, um, of course, Shakespeare expected them to be presented. So he expected it to be a dramatic presentation. Uh, they, were not, they were published as uh, in quarto versions for people to read during the Renaissance, but they weren't published as uh, a, a collection of plays. Um, and when they were published, finally, as a collection of plays, then it was up to the editors to create act and scene differentiations. That's not something that Shakespeare did. He wrote the dialogue and um, possibly worked on the staging. But um, the editors actually put in uh, stage directions like enter Hamlet or exit Hamlet. And therefore, all of those things should be suspect to us. Um, the uh, five-act division um, can, could be considered a three-act division as well, um, but it also doesn't hurt to see it as five acts. If we see it as three acts, we have three important scenes, and Shakespeare does seem to emphasize um, usually act one, scene two, act three, scene two, and act five, scene two particularly, so dividing this into the three-act uh, structure would also work. Um, Act One usually introduces all of the issues, the characters, the main themes. Uh, it ends in some kind of instigating event, like the banishment of uh, Cordelia, um, or it, um, um, or the the choice of um, the characters from the tavern to uh, to rob um, the passersby. Uh, so there's some kind of an instigating event that will lead us to the climax. The climax is developed somewhere in uh, between Acts Four and Act uh, Acts Two and Act Four. Um, it actually is usually at the midpoint, which is Act Three, Scene Two, which is usually the pivotal event. And again, what often happens there uh, in terms of um, structure is that you have uh, action going forward 
in one particular direction. When we get to the midpoint, something happens at that particular time. This is usually Act 3, Scene 2, or somewhere around there, Act 3, Scene 3. And the, the action then turns in a different direction and leads inevitably to the end of the play and the, um, the denouement of the play. Um, Act fi 5 is the uh, place where all of the, the conflicts are resolved. The, um, in the comedy, you have the inclusion. In the tragedy, you have the uh, exclusion or the deaths that take place. Uh, and all of this is part of the uh, structure of the overall play. Um, I do want to remind you that we don't have stage directions like Enter Hamlet. And I think this is very important. We do have lines that can tell when somebody is on the stage. Um, uh, obviously, if a person has a line, then that person is on the stage. Or we can have lines like Gertrude's line, Oh, look where the poor wretch comes reading, that lets us know that Hamlet is coming onto the stage. But in terms of when exactly he uh, came onto the stage or when he might have been able to overhear the discussion that was taking place right before that, um, that's something that can be left up to individual editor or individual um, directors in productions. And I think that kind of ambiguity really adds interest to the plays themselves. Um, again, the conventionally important scenes, very, very briefly to uh, um, reiterate, Act 1, Scene 2, uh, Act 3, Scene 2, Act 5, Scene 2. Usually these are court scenes. Usually these are public scenes. They don't have to be. Um, but they'll almost always include many of the main characters, not just the, the one main character, but most of the main characters. And the actions that will take place there will affect not only the individual family members or the characters on a microcosm that are interacting and having conflict with each other, but also will affect the state so that that idea of the microcosm and the macrocosm interacting um, um, as part of the development of the play, the things that the individuals do also affecting the things that happen to the state, that makes their actions and their decisions much more important. And the fact that we have these as court public scenes uh, reinforces that. The, uh, Shakespeare has two main structures that he uh, uses in his plays. One is the rise and fall. This is the more simplistic of the two structures. He uses it in Richard II. We'll talk a little bit more detail about it. Shakespeare doesn't do the traditional just rise of the character and then fall of the character, which would be that first um, um, arrow that, that is at the top of this particular slide. Um, that would be like the rise of Julius Caesar and the fall of Julius Caesar. Uh, that's typical of many other plays from the Renaissance, but Shakespeare tends to com uh, complicate his rise and fall structure even more. Um, and we have not only the rise of one character, but the fall of another at the same time. And that's represented more by the X that you see on this particular um, slide. And there we'll see that in Richard II with the rise of uh, Bolingbroke to power as Richard falls. But again, Shakespeare compli uh, complicates this even further with the idea that you can have a physical rise and fall and you can have a psychological rise and fall as well. In other words, a uh, person's fortunes in the world might go up and yet his character might seem to decline. And we'll see that with Bolingbroke, who is uh, Henry IV, where he begins honorably, but he ends uh, usurping the throne. So his psychological character has fallen, whereas his physical uh, situation, he begins at the feet of a king, uh, pleading, um, uh, petitioning for justice. And he ends as the king, um, dispensing justice. So you've got um, kind of the, uh, an opposition of rise and fall taking place within the same character. The same thing is true with Richard II, of course. The other plot structure that we see in uh, Shakespeare more often, and this is the more complex of the plot structures, is the main plot, subplot parallelism. And we'll see this in most of the uh, um, tragedies and also in the golden comedies, where you have the main plot characters uh, usually the upper class characters, the kings, the queens, um, the interaction that affects the state as well as um, um, being just the, the conflict and resolution 
for the individual uh, characters. The subplot in this case is usually the uh, either the lower class characters or the secondary family characters, the Gloucester family in Lear, the Polonius family in Hamlet, and often the, the things that are happening in that family are um, reflections of the main issues and themes that are happening in the main plot, um, and therefore we get a fuller um, discussion or analysis of this particular plot. Um, the subplot um, often can, uh, the, actually there can be several different subplots, I should say, uh, all of which may illustrate different aspects of the main plot or the interactions that are taking place between the main characters. A more complex main plot subplot um, structure we're going to see in Merchant of Venice, where we actually have three plots, uh, the main plot for the casket scene, then we have a subplot that is developed that begins in Act 3 and ends in Act, in Act 4, and then another main plot that begins in Act 3 and ends in Act 5. So you can have an inter interweaving of main plots and subplots, as we'll see in Twelfth Night, or um, uh, t several different main plots that might uh, follow each other sequentially. I'd like to take a little bit of time to talk about why Shakespeare is the best writer ever. I think um, most people would accept this. I remember when we uh, got to the turn of the millennium, and um, I don't remember what channel it was, maybe it was the Discovery Channel, was counting down the most important uh, people from the last millennium, and I was sure that number one was going to be uh, Shakespeare, and it turned out Shakespeare was number four and number one was um, Gutenberg for developing the Gutenberg Press. Okay, I, I can grant that perhaps that was a very, very important discovery uh, in the last millennium. But most people do accept Shakespeare as a, the uh, greatest writer ever, and I'd like to talk a little bit about why that is. Um, we've, we've discussed the microcosm, macrocosm concept, and the idea that what, what uh, Shakespeare does is he's he's actually debating the different worldviews, the Renaissance Christian world, the Renaissance humanist Christian worldview, and the Machiavellian worldview to see which one is more practical, which one is more um, right, which one is more virtuous. All of those are part of his discussion. We have um, the microcosm level uh, today in many plays uh, in which just uh, the interaction between families is enough to get our interest and to carry us through to the end of the play and to be discussing important themes. The fact that Shakespeare includes the uh, macrocosm of the state and also this uh, worldview dis uh, debate or analysis uh, adds several additional layers to the conflict and the resolution for his plays. He, used, he, of course, deals with very profound topics. He talks about revenge. He talks about death. He talks about love, things that are very um, essential and, and um, that affect all of us in a very, very profound way. He's got a lot of complexity in his plays. Things are not um, uh, simple. We have the multiplicity of uh, identity, um, the change that takes place over the course of the play, but also uh, the complexity of the characters themselves. And the, um, the fact that Shakespeare does not give us answers. Uh, he will evaluate an issue from many, many different perspectives, but he won't necessarily uh, give us what he thinks is the, the right answer. So he's not didactic. The ambiguity comes from this. Uh, so we have uh, various different interpretations that are all supportable from the text itself. And um, that, of course, gives rise to a lot of criticism. Um, in fact, more has been written about Shakespeare than almost any other topic except for perhaps the Bible. But um, it also makes it more interesting. It means you can come back to the plays uh, 10 years later, 20 years later, see something new in the plays, uh, come up with an entirely different interpretation of that character or, the, or that play at that particular time. Um, I'd also like to point out that um, on my website uh, you can find an awful lot of additional information uh, that would be helpful for this course. We have, um, uh, I have information on the course itself, the requirements for the course, the kind of paper topics you could choose from, the um, uh, my rationale for the way in which I teach the class, but also the PowerPoint presentations that will be used for these uh, lectures are available. You can print them out ahead of time and take notes. 
uh, on those PowerPoint presentations if you want. The texts of the plays are available as well, and my commentary on many of the important passages is there. There is an annotated bibliography of Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare criticism, that you can take a look at. And there will be links to the video clips and the lectures for, actual, for the people who are actually enrolled in the class, as well as links to other uh, interesting sites that are available on that website as well. At any rate, I hope you will enjoy this class. Again, my name is Christine Barkley. I hope to see you next time. Mm -hmm.